know what you're thinking and your confusion is completely understandable. I'm not Howard Feldman and yet this is an episode of Synthesis TV. But not to worry, everybody's favorite host will return to the channel in 2023. The reason why I am here filling in for Howard, however, is to talk to some of the brilliant minds at Synthesis about a certain technological breakthrough that's made such waves in recent weeks. I'm Marco Martins and this is Synthesis TV. This is Synthesis TV, keeping you on the edge of technology and business. On the 30th of November, nearly two weeks ago, at least at the time of this recording, the public was introduced to ChatGBT, a prototype chatbot that has the tech world absolutely buzzing. Created by San Francisco-based artificial intelligence company OpenAI, ChatGBT is gaining traction because of its human-like and deeply detailed answers to user inquiries. But these advanced capabilities of the tech aren't primarily responsible for all the chatter around ChatGBT, but rather its potential applications. So with me to discuss ChatGBT and the influence it's gonna have in future markets is Archie Arakal, the practice lead of intelligent data at Synthesis, and Maria Nietlin, the principal of AI at Synthesis. So two of the great uh, artificial intelligence and intelligent data members from the brilliant team at Synthesis. Let's get into it. Maria, I want to start with you. ChatGBT, obviously big exciting news, great new advances in technology, chatbots on something new. So why is this from an application standpoint going to be so different? Why is it so massively spoken about? Right. Um, you, may have, you may have seen, if you've been checking the news, all the amazing things that ChatGPT3 has been coming up with. Um, and because it has been trained in so many fields, um, the massive training set, it, it knows a little bit about everything, about every discipline, about every field that, um, you know, academic and, and otherwise that is available on the internet. So it can do things that professional people can, can do or imitate things that professional people can do. Things like lawyers or people like lawyers and doctors and architects and yeah. even programmers. Yeah, that's the interesting one. I think the, the start of it has been programming, right? Is because obviously the tech industry has been very interested in everything tech. The, you, you guys are the first people to stay up to date with new technology, new developments. So you're the first to test out an application. And obviously the first thing you do is like, okay, is my code correct? Like, let me run my code through this. That's not something new necessarily. There's been other artificial intelligence code checkers in the past, but ChatGBT has somehow shifted that a few extra steps. It's, it's a code writer. Mm. If you you can ask it to write code with a specific function um, and it'll produce the code that you can then execute. So it can make, you know, non-programmers um, turn them into programmers actually. That's incredible. And you gave the example of like legal practitioners earlier on. And one of the examples I read up about online is say, I'm a television show producer and you're a software company and we need to come up with some sort of contractual agreement for services. We can put in the parameters that we require, much what we would have to tell an attorney anyways, that we're gonna offer this number of services over this duration of time. Can you draft a contract in accordance to South African law? And ChatGBT should be able to print up a contract and in a much shorter time frame as well. Yeah, we've seen it do um, exactly that, write up contracts. I mean, at the moment, it's not a professional thinking person sitting behind the contract. So although, although it might look, you know, accurate and like how a lawyer would write something up, it may actually make mistakes and you wouldn't know probably as a layperson. So there are, you know, caveats to the content that ChatGPT3 produces. You can't always take it at face value. Yeah, so all the attorneys can stop gasping for air. <laughs> your job's still safe for now. <laughs> you still have an occupation for now. Your expertise are still required. Obviously, a lot of the chat, Archie, maybe you can speak to this as we continue down application standpoint before we go into what the technology really is and how it's so different, is Google as a search engine. Now, this is something that people have been discussing for the longest time, just waiting for the day that Google is the disrupted technology, no longer the disruptor. 
Um, why is that? Yeah. So, look, I think the biggest thing, and this is just comp- it might be a little bit left wing from what, what we're talking about, but one of the things that ChatGPT has kind of shown everyone in this time is that they people like asking questions and having an interactive response, right? That is something that is people are missing. And with Google, yes, you can get somewhat interactive, but it's still a search engine at the end of the day. So the reason why ChatGPT is really coming to the why people are asking these questions is because if uh, so there was there was a stat like I think it was close to 1 million users that had reached in the first six days of being up being uh, publicly available and that why there was such a huge amount of people on the platform was purely because of that interaction capability and having the ability to actually speak with something that is more human like as opposed to the Google traditional Google search engine is pretty much just, you know, you can ask a question and you get a bunch of search results. And it's it's not as interactive and as human as a chat as as ChatGPT3 as well. So kind of that's kind of where the two why it's two different things and why ChatGPT is starting to get that traction in comparison to Google as well. And I think consolidation is another thing, right? Is you look at Google and it's here are 20 articles related to your search. And Google's been so successful because they put the top three first. Yeah. Or so so you like you you find your answer relatively quickly by going through three or four articles. It's like by the time you're through your fourth article, you've you've come to a solution. Yeah. But with ChatGBT, it's more, far more consolidated, is that it's not even a full article that you need to go through. It's almost immediate. He has your answer. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the things we forget when when we're doing a Google search, it's actually somewhat biased as well. It's based on your locations, based on people that are similar to you. So there is a lot of those biases that keep introdu- that is introduced into a search engine as well. Whereas with ChatGPT, a lot of that is actually being removed because it's more functional. Specific. Like for example, the legal contracts is an example. Mm. You have one specific use case you're trying to solve, solve for. Same with coding, it's one specific use case and it's interactive as well. So it's a little bit different from the traditional searching, but you still get the end, re- the end result is the same. And of course, there's certain things that, like politics, for example, that's far more open to your opinions and interpretation. Mm-hmm. We we have to wonder how is AI going to take a liking to this, and could this possibly resolve our issues in politics? You know, the the binary politics of our world is like I'm on this team, you're on that team. Could something like this aid us in finding the real answers to things, Maria? <laughs> Bit of a big question. It's, yeah. it's like a big picture question. But, yeah. it's, you know, perhaps long term, is the technology getting closer to this point? Will, will anything ever yeah. <laughs> no. so help us solve our biases or get us uh, to have the same opinions? I suppose it's the, the nice thing about, you know, people and being, and, human. And being human. We have different opinions and we'll always have that um, as long as we not part of some hive mind where we all have neural links implanted <laughs> in our brains and we all, you know, basically is a single organism. Yeah. We'll all have our uh, separate opinions. And so artificial intelligence isn't necessarily something extremely new. It's, it's of course, new technology compared to all technology yes. like cars and motorcycles and things is technology, telephones, technology. So relative to that, AI is new, but relative to the very short time frame of advancement, AI isn't something new. It's been around for a long time. How is ChatGBT different to previous chatbots? How is it different to uh, the AI of the past? So how it's different to previous chatbots. Previous chatbots, designers um, had to specifically engineer and design the dialogue and how the conversation was going to flow. And you couldn't go outside of those bounds. Um, so ChatGPT3 or ChatGPT is uh, open-ended, um, or what is the right word? There's no domain. Yeah, there's you know? no. It's not really ring fenced to a specific set of topics or intents. It's it's quite extensive in terms of how much what it's been trained on. It's an open-ended chatbot. It can basically chat about anything that was in its training corpus, mm-hmm. which is really a, a very large corpus of um, data that's been trained on. Yeah, so it's just this vast access to data that it can use to determine what it believes is the best answer for your question. That's and right. That's it. Yes. Uh, whereas opposed to uh, more regularly daily use chatbots like a WhatsApp chatbot for a telephone company. 
but this really throws that almost completely out is that it's it's improved it far beyond that um, there's still going to be restrictions. Obviously, it's in your best interest to still maintain restrictions on application-based chatbots. You know, is, is ChatGBT is not going to be a massive accelerant in that regard? So I think we, we can't get away from explainable AI. Like AI at the end of the day, whatever product you build, there has to be some sort of explainability behind it, especially if it's customer facing, right? So there's always going to be that element that we need to consider. So. Even though we're going, we're speaking about ChatGPT at the moment, and it's super exciting. It's it's open ended. You know, there's there's so many different applications and use cases. In the practical sense, there is always, I guess you could say, red tape, or there's always some sort of governance and regulations we need to put in place. So yes, ChatGPT can do all these things, but when we bring it back into a practical sense, there are going to be some limitations around. So for example, imagine that you have ChatGPT speaking on WhatsApp, and all of a sudden people are asking for medical diagnosis. That is, that is probably not the yeah. best best way. Why is to my do that? ISP telling me to take blood pressure medication? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then you're going to need a new contract drafted by ChatGBT to protect you exactly. from the legal proceedings. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's an incredible advancement because of the open ended nature of it. It's certainly very exciting with all of those applications, and um, of course, with artif artificial intelligence, the more it's used, we find historically in, in AI, the more it's used, the better it gets. Mm. Yeah. No. Marek, could you explain a little bit of how that works? So with ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI has employed a process called reinforcement learning. And re reinforcement learning is basically the same way humans learn. Um, when, when you do something correct, you get sort of praised. And when you do something incorrect, um, there's repercussions. So through all the interactions with its users, um, ChatGPT3 then learns what the correct responses are and it keeps on improving just like a human would by just this reinforcement learning process. Yeah, so it's just creating a bigger data pool for it to pull its reasoning out of. And it's like, like a training program, really, for people, is that it's like, oh, okay, cool, I've got a new textbook to go through in order to be able to solve people's problems quicker and easier and better. It's very interesting. Uh, we spoke a little bit off air before we started about ChatGBT3. GBT3 or ChatGBT? I, I keep mixing the two as well, so it's that problem. So there's GBT3? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So ChatGBT is basically a fine-tuned version of GPT-3, which is the large foundational model that sits behind it. Um, and then OpenAI took the reinforcement learning approach to turn this model that could already generate content into a chat-style language model that is very good at this chat. Um, ask a question, give a response, then elaborate on the previous um, questions and responses you got and it keeps it in context so it, it follows the conversation and I think what's fascinating about the the human nature of the model um, when AI was first introduced to the public as an idea uh, a lot of the futurists were discussing the concept of the employment opportunities of the future will be creative this will be what human beings will do. Uh, artificial intelligence and machines will take over the mundane daily processes of the human being. Mm. And then more creative pursuits would be what would be left for human beings to do because a machine would never be able to make music, make art, uh, come up with content, produce content like a, like a human being will. And we're seeing more and more that artificial intelligence is able to do these things. Mm. So I think maybe one of the examples I can give with ChatGPT as an example. So one of my lecturers actually, um, he was actually telling me that he's going to make lecture notes now from from ChatGPT, and I thought that was a bit strange. But anyways, he continued. But and he tried to make these lecture notes, and it actually was able to get to a point where he had more in 30 minutes. He was able to get a fairly well articulated lecture set of lecture notes that he could utilize. Whereas usually it would take, it would take a good couple of hours to get some really good content. So what, what ChatGPT has done for him specifically is he's cut down how much time he would spend on make, doing those mundane tasks of creating lecture notes. It's, it's, a, it's a small example, but that's, that's one of the effects it has. Now he has more time to spend with me to help me with my research as well. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's, that's those sort of things that 
it's actually helping with. So definitely there is um, a lot of these AI models that are coming into the platform these days are helping in that regard. But one of the things we need to remember is it's not a once-off solution. It's not something that once it's there, it's, that's the end of it. We need human beings to validate this. And that's essentially how AI and humans should work together, not AI does its own thing, humans do its own thing. They do need to work collaboratively, and it does free some time for human beings to work on other things as well. That's a very hopeful message to <laughs> finish off on. I mean, we've seen this historically with technology in all ages of, of human beings. We've seen massive job shortages in the introduction of a uh, moving assembly line you know, something fairly simple, but then eventually human beings adapt to the new technology and then we just use it as a tool to make our lives easier, to make the our ability to do our job well quicker and more efficiently. And uh, I think education, that's the next big thing, right? Is, yeah. you know, we can, the internet has been one of the big learning tools for all human beings. And now the expansion of AI will help people learn more faster as well, mm. so. Really great, hopeful message. Archie, Marie, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an episode of Synthesis TV. Remember to subscribe below. Howard Feldman will be back with you in future episodes of Synthesis TV. I've been Marco Martins bringing you this chat about ChatGBT. Uh, expect more in the near future. Thank you, goodbye.